Okay, I would say um, our speaker is, has arrived, so we can actually start the session. So uh, welcome everyone um, to this uh, session, uh, IGF session um, on uh, emerging privacy enhancing uh, technologies, but also a little bit more. So maybe as a short introduction, my name is Christian Ramsbach. I'm a member of the Secretari OECD Secretariat I'm in charge of um, privacy and data governance. And today we, uh, we have a, a good, interesting set of different speakers um, that will talk to us about the role, essentially the role of technologies for enhancing privacy and uh, data governance uh, with trust. We will not only talk about classic privacy enhancing technologies such as, um, let's pick one, homomorphic encryption or federated learning, which uh, we, um, and has been discussed in the past a lot, but we actually will have a broader discussion about what is the, the role of digital technologies for not only being, for going beyond to be the problem when it comes to privacy, but also to become a solution or to be used as a solution, and what are the challenges related to that. So um, we have uh, different speakers um, um, that will uh, make an intervention. We will start indeed um, uh, with the, the role of privacy enhancing technologies, um, but then we will um, move to broader discussions. And without further ado, um, I would like to, to invite our very first uh, speaker uh, from the um, UK's uh, Data Protection Authority to, to make uh, her intervention. Um, and maybe I will let each of you briefly introduce yourself, because maybe that's a little bit quicker before, instead of going through um, each of you individually. Um, so um, I would say let's start with the very first presentation. And uh, Clara, the floor is yours, but maybe uh, very briefly, if I may say so. So the idea in terms of the run-up show is to have a series of interventions by our speakers. Um, they have roughly seven minutes. Um, and after that, um, we will have a, a first um, -ish set of questions and discussions. And we will then open the floor roughly 30 minutes before the end, open the floor to the audience. Um, and uh, we may have also a second round um, after that. So be prepared. And um, Clara, the floor is, is yours. If you may introduce yourself very briefly, um, also talk a little bit about the ICO if you want, and then go ahead with, uh, with the subject matter. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Christian. And can I just check, are the slides showing well on your side? It's showing pretty well, yes. Okay, great. Um, so um, my name is Clara Clark Neville, um, and I'm joining you from the UK this morning. Well, my morning, I guess your afternoon. Um, and thank you very much for come, uh, having me. And I'm, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, so my bit will be to talk about the privacy enhancing technologies aspect. And in doing so, I'll also kind of introduce my role and maybe the role of the information commissioner. Um, so the way that um, the ICO regard privacy enhancing technologies is basically as a tool to enable data sharing. Um, if you're not familiar with the Information Commissioner's Office, we're the UK's uh, independent data protection authority. Um, we regulate uh, data protection and wider information rights. Um, we're, as other data protection authorities, we are um, independent of government, but publicly funded. Um, we produce guidance, we take enforcement action, we provide advice and support for organisations and members of the public, um, and we also engage with governments and other stakeholders on um, advancing policy positions in this area. So within this, uh, I work at a, uh, within a technology policy team, um, and our role is to anticipate and understand and shape how emerging technologies and innovation impact people and society. And that's very much how uh, I've approached privacy enhancing technologies. So um, maybe the first question would be, well, what are privacy enhancing technologies? But actually, I'm not going to start from there um, because I think um, although it's interesting to understand how they work and what they do, what they are, it's, I think, more interesting to approach what does a privacy enhancing technology actually do? So um, this is quite a vague term. It covers multiple disparate techniques and I see it more as a sort of toolbox that um, each one of toolbox can do a different thing. And instead of explaining, you know, what is a hammer? What does a ha It's more interesting to see, well, what can a hammer do for you? So if you have 
um, some furniture that you need to assemble, how can you put this furniture together? So not so much what, like, how do you make a, a screwdriver? What are the technical components of a screwdriver? But the screwdriver allows you to screw in two pieces together. And with that optic um, is how I'd invite you to approach privacy enhancing technologies. So instead of focusing straight away on the tools, I'd start with explaining what the problem is. So what is this furniture that we're trying to assemble? Um, and broadly, the furniture we're trying to assemble, the problem statement that we have is that data sharing is difficult. Um, there's lots of different scenarios in which data sharing has challenges. Um, these challenges are sometimes data protection law, but in many cases, they're much broader. So they will be um, reputational, commercial, uh, organizational barriers. So typical scenarios of data sharing involve um, two or more organizations who are trying to um, share data between each other. So for example, a hospital and the local government might want to share data to see what the overlap of um, patients or social services is. Then we have a scenario, another very common scenario is publication of data. So this is no longer reciprocal sharing, but um, outputting of data to an audience or to the public at large. Then we have um, sort of putting multiple databases into one. So one organization ingests data from multiple sources. Um, so you might think of a local government wanting to make uh, road layout improvements and they need to take in data from the police and maybe from hospital, maybe citizen feedback, cycling campaign data, and they need to bring it all together. And another typical um, scenario is just the need to keep data secure. So, for example, um, if a government uses an external provider to host data, um, they may need to need to be sure that it's particularly secure. So these are the sort of problem statements we have with various tasks to be done. Um, and uh, now I'll move on to explain what, what tools might be the best to use for this. And this is kind of where the privacy enhancing technology bit fits in. So what are they, what do we do? Um, so in the first scenario where you need to share data between multiple parties, I've clumped together the types of privacy enhancing technologies that would be useful in that scenario. So um, I won't dwell on them in detail, um, given the time constraints, but I'm happy to go back to them later if anyone has questions, but I'll just give a brief overview. Um, if, uh, homomorphic encryption, the, the kind of underlying concept is that it allows uh, computations to be performed on encrypted data without the data first being decrypted, um, which keeps the data much more secure and minimizes the access that you can have to it. Um, secure multi-party computation is a relatively similar protocol but more suitable for large groups um, and zero knowledge proofs are a bit different they um, refer to uh, a protocol where one person needs to prove something to somebody else so we could say typically um, whether you're above a certain age so you're eligible to do a certain activity you know, drive a car purchase alcohol and instead of revealing the underlying data so maybe date of birth you can just prove that you're over whatever the, the threshold is so it minimizes the data that is shared. Uh, for publication and ingestion, uh, two techniques are both applicable. So differential privacy um, is a way to prevent information about specific individuals being revealed or inferenced about them being made. So it adds noise uh, to records and measures how much information about a certain person is revealed. Um, well, synthetic data is essentially artificial data um, so, uh, which replicates the patterns or still properties of the real data. So you would have a real data set, generate a synthetic data set that maintains its same properties, but is not the real underlying data. So um, either anonymizes or significantly de-identifies the data, depending on which route you go down. Um, and then finally, trusted execution, oh, not finally, um, but I'll, uh, so federated learning first. Uh, federated learning is very useful for uh, ingesting data from multiple sources. So typically you would need to move all the data across to a central hub. So imagine you are developing a tool for medical imaging. You need to collect all the medical images from a whole group of hospitals to have a large enough data set to train the model that you're then going to use to detect these images. And with federated learning, you avoid the need to move the data across and you instead train a model locally and then bring together centrally 
um, the improvements in that model. So it really reduces the need to share data. Um, and then finally, trusted execution environments um, are essentially a security application that um, uh, sort of makes um, both hardware and software that allows data to be isolated within a system. So that's a whistle stop tour. Um, and um, I'll move on to talk a little bit about our involvement in this area as the ICO. So um, this year, in June this year, we published guidance on privacy enhancing technologies. So if you'd like to know more detail about anything that I've talked about, I would highly recommend you read the guidance. Um, and we have focused on um, the link between these technologies and the benefits they bring to data protection law. So how privacy enhancing technologies can support data minimization, data security, uh, and data protection by design and by default. Um, we provided explanations for all the technologies, for people who are not familiar with them, and also uh, that mapping between the use of the tool and the compliance with the law to help both um, decision makers in organizations, um, developers of these technologies. Um, and that's a, a flavor of what the guidance contains, this kind of one-to-one -one mapping with, okay, you're using a tool, how should you use a tool and how will it help? And we've also provided examples of uh, scenarios in which pets could be appropriate. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to talking a bit more about the risks and benefits, but um, I think it's important to note that privacy enhancing technologies really, really help with data sharing and data reuse, um, but they're still a relatively emerging field. Um, there's some very... Um, uh, there's some great examples of them being used already in practice, um, so they're not an academic concept, but they're um, still relatively uh, new, so there's issues still with maturity and expertise. I'm just, uh, I can see Christian's looking, <laughs> looking at me, so I'm going to finish up, um, which is that there's still a few challenges to solve, as I, as I mentioned, so, um, you know, they're a great screwdriver, but they're maybe not yet an electric screwdriver, and there's still issues to understand how we can match up well the users of privacy enhancing technologies with the developers so how do you bring the expertise to the people who need them and how can technical standards develop in this area and how can costs be brought down so that's my introduction to privacy enhancing technologies and i'll hand back to Kristen. thank you very much clara and uh, may maybe before we move on to the next presenter i just um, want to provide a, a little bit of uh, context why we started with uh, Clara's presentation, because I, I, I realized that I missed maybe to, to clarify that point. And the reason is because privacy enhancing technologies have been traditionally um, been looked at as the, um, the, this has been essentially the first kind of approaches and tools if you want. Uh, when you ask, if you ask people, think about the role of digital technologies and how we can protect privacy, people would traditionally or typically point to privacy enhancing technologies. And as uh, Clara's presentation has uh, highlighted, uh, this has evolved definitely. So there are now new types of privacy enhancing technologies um, that she, she addressed. Uh, and maybe one, if I may, Clara, ask you one question, um, because it actually also opens up a little bit uh, for latest discussion. Why has the ICO um, decided to, to look into to this and to publish the guidance? If you could elaborate that a little bit before we then move to, the, to the, uh, our next presenter who is sitting next to me. Of course. So we've long been advocates for kind of responsible data sharing and it's something that stakeholders frequently tell us that data sharing is really hard that even no matter how much we say data protection is not a barrier to data sharing, um, there are always challenges. And a lot of the challenges we were seeing were not so much legal, but they were more organizational and business-wise in the sense of you um, would have a data, uh, a data set and you would not want to share it because you don't know what's going to happen to it afterwards, which is a, le a legitimate concern. Um, and with privacy enhancing technology, you can massively reduce that risk. So I was talking about homomorphic encryption. If you hand over a data set to a third party, you don't know what they're going to do with that. You know, you have a contract to say how they can use it, but you don't have ultimate visibility over it. While if you implement homomorphic encryption, there's a, there's a technical limit to the queries that you can put in. So you have a, a guarantee that the data is only being queried 
for a pre-approved set of things. So we, we thought um, it's exciting and useful to develop mm. data sharing. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think now is a good time to move to um, our next speaker. Um, I will also ask you to introduce yourself. Um, but maybe as a, as a kind of a, a context why um, uh, you are next, essentially we thought that um, everybody probably knows the Mozilla Foundation and um, they are obviously also user using privacy enhancing technologies and we will hear about that. So essentially it is a good um, illustration about not only the potential of privacy enhancing technologies but also an example where every one of us is potentially interacting with this kind of technology. So um, again, I will please introduce yourself. Maybe you want to talk about the Mozilla Foundation eventually. And yes. Thank you. Uh, so hi, I'm Udbhav Tiwari. I work uh, with the Mozilla's public policy team uh, where I'm the head of global product policy. Uh, my job is to work with internal technical experts and external regulators and lawmakers to help them understand the consequences of uh, regulation as well as ways in which that regulation could be improved um, to further Mozilla's mission. Um, and Mozilla is a unique organization because we're, of course, known most for our browser, but we're actually a corporation that's owned by a foundation. So the Mozilla Corporation has a single share that's owned by the Mozilla Foundation, and that means that most of the typical incentives that apply in the technology sector don't necessarily apply to us. Shareholder pressure, the drive or pressure for profits, um, uh, and which at some level we believe are responsible for some of the more egregious practices when it comes to data collection in the space. And the reason uh, that context I think is particularly important for this session is Mozilla as an organization, when we started the Firefox browser now almost 25 years ago, for the first maybe 10 to 15 years had a very strong policy of simply not collecting any data at all. Um, and uh, usually when organizations say that, they're actually talking about user data. So for example, even today, Mozilla's uh, browsing history is end-to-end -end encrypted, which means that if you have history, say, on your desktop and you're op accessing it on your phone, the only two places where that history exists in an unencrypted format are those two devices. Mozilla does not have access to that. Um, but 15 years ago, we didn't even collect any telemetry. Um, and uh, there was obviously both it came from our very strong privacy credentials and the idea that we would not collect any data at all, even if it's not directly about our users or, the, or their practices. But ultimately, we realized as we became a more popular browser that uh, for a product that people use to access hundreds of millions, in fact, billions of websites around the internet, not having access to any telemetry would mean that we would never be able to make a product that would actually serve our users because that telemetry was used to detect which websites were breaking and which websites were throwing compatibility errors so that we could then go investigate those websites and speak directly to developers in a manner that we could resolve that and make changes in our products to help make sure that they don't uh, happen again. Um, and that's the period when we started exploring privacy preserving ways of collecting this information, uh, which within Mozilla essentially means separating the who from the what. Um, and uh, that separation for us uh, has been quite a long journey. Um, and that journey specifically, I think, over the last three to four years has uh, crystallized around maybe three issues. And I think those are the three kind of like s maybe samples that I will be talking about to both explore Mozilla's thinking, but also to react to developments that are taking place in the external world. Um, the first is there's definitely been a recognition that the proliferation of internet availability, bandwidth, and connectivity, along with computational power, has enabled certain kinds of privacy preserving technologies today that were not available uh, or not as mm. feasible um, a few years ago. Uh, the second is that um, privacy uh, post 2014 has definitely, both because of laws like the GDPR, but also because of reputational concerns, actively started to become a uh, differentiator between products and people are choosing products because of that uh, because of privacy so the um, net investment that is coming into the space in these technologies has increased um, and finally um, and uh, this is both related to Mozilla but something that we don't do ourselves is the developments that are taking place in the advertising ecosystem specifically Google's Chrome privacy sandbox set of technologies um, which have garnered a lot of attention over the last couple of years for attempting to do all of the parts of the advertising ecosystem uh, target Targeting, attribution, remarketing in uh, a more privacy preserving manner. And Mozilla has arguably been one of the biggest and most vocal 
uh, uh, critics of some of these technologies because we think while they are better than the current practices that are enabled by the third party ecosystem, uh, the technical validation of many of the claims that they make still requires some work. And, and those are the three things that I'm actually going to talk about. On the first piece, which is uh, Mozilla's own practices, um, there are, I would say, two standards that people at Mozilla have been integrally involved in that are now uh, almost done at the IETF. One of them is actually done. Uh, one of them is Oblivious HTTP, and the other is DAP, which is the Distributed Aggregation Protocol. Both of these standards essentially work by firstly sending data in a manner where there is an intermediary or a proxy in between that separates where the data is coming from from what the actual substance of that data is um, for the individuals um, on uh, like in the room and on the session if you use uh, apple's private relay service which is available on ios it works in a very similar manner uh, in order to set so that even apple does not know um, either your dns lookups or your browsing history because it's first sent to a proxy where the proxy strips the information about where it's coming from and then it's sent to uh, the destination, um, ultimately. Uh, Mozilla is actively exploring ways in which we could use these technologies in order to collect telemetry information, and we expect to make some announcements on this regard in the coming weeks and months. Um, there's been a lot of progress, uh, but one of the things that has actually held us back, uh, I would say, is that the number of players in the ecosystem that are willing to engage uh, with these technologies is still actually quite limited, um, both from the demand side, which is like how many players actually want to collect technologies with these privacy-preserving manners and in, in this manner. And as you can imagine, the more suppliers they are, the more customers they are, the more competition is, the cheaper they will be, has definitely not happened yet. Uh, despite the fact that in comparison to some of the more complicated and possibly more promising technologies like homomorphic encryption, uh, these are much, much cheaper. And it's not actually technology that is holding the deployment of uh, DAP or the deployment of uh, oblivious uh, HTTP back. It's the fact that there are actually very few service providers that provide the infrastructure to be able to utilize these technologies, which are, relatively speaking, much easier to implement than uh, uh, differential privacy or homomorphic encryption. Uh, on the second point, which is uh, the uh, Mozilla's own thinking with regard to the developments in the space, um, I, I would say that when it comes to the evolution around targeted advertising um, that's taken place, it's almost certain now that the only browser in the market that still collects or has not disabled third-party cookies yet by default is Google Chrome. And the pressure that um, Google has been subject to by privacy advocates, by regulators on this has been quite high. So what Google has done is now proposed a set of technologies called the privacy sandbox technologies that attempt to do what the current advertising ecosystem does in a more privacy-preserving manner. Um, what Mozilla has said on this more broadly is that we support the idea. Uh, we support the concept of why the idea exists because Mozilla, for example, does not block ads by default in Mozilla Firefox. We do believe that advertising is a valid way to support uh, publishers on the internet. However, we do think that the current state of the advertising ecosystem is absolutely unsustainable. And that's the reason we block trackers, that's the reason we block fingerprinters, and all of the underlying infrastructure that may enable the advertising ecosystem, including third-party cookies, are actively harmful to user privacy and security. And we've done a lot of technical work in the last couple of years in order to implement that. Uh, the biggest one uh, there is TCP, or Total Cookie Protection, uh, which actually creates jars of information in which people can, when websites, when you visit a website, say, uh, the New York Times com, and there's a button on the New York Times com that lets you like a Facebook, uh, like it on Facebook or share it on Facebook. Facebook actually gets the ability to drop a cookie onto your computer that will then also uh, note the fact that you've been to newyorktimes.com, you've been to instagram.com, you've been to washingtonpost.com, which may also have that button. And what Firefox does is it creates jars where each time a website is accessed, there's a separate uh, jar in which the cookie for that website and all uh, many other uh, identifiers are dropped. And these jars cannot talk to each other. So that's a way of limiting the harm of the ecosystem while still giving users the ability to gain from the benefits of third-party cookies because we also use heuristics in order to determine is this an advertising third-party cookie or is it a third-party cookie that's actually enabling a uh, single sign-on, which is essentially when you click on sign-in with Google or sign-in with Apple on different websites uh, as well. 
Um, and as we develop these technologies, uh, the one thing that we realize is, is that firstly, it's actually possible to give users a good balanced experience between those two things, which is not having tracking, but still allowing them to support publishers if they choose to do so, and uh, giving them the option to say, go to the Mozilla add-on store and download an ad blocker if that's what they want to do. So we think that that choice has been very valuable. Mm. Um, and finally, because I know uh, I'm at time as well, is on the Google Privacy Sandbox piece, um, what we have said is that right now there's a very serious risk that the standards and technologies under Google Privacy Sandbox will become the de facto way in which large parts of these activities are carried out on the internet. And we think that that's both a privacy concern, but also more importantly, a competition concern. Because it's that interplay between privacy and competition where traditional advertisers who are not Google don't like those technologies technologies because they say that that will mean Google's own technology and uh, first party mode of data will become more valuable. Um, and people like us and more pri and privacy advocates don't like those technologies because they don't go far enough, right? So it, it's definitely a scenario where everyone is like quite unhappy with the state of, of play. But what Mozilla thinks is that if these standards are going to be deployed, and they are, Google has announced that they will become, um, they will stop third party cookies by the end of next year. We think that they should happen at standards bodies because there is a process in standards bodies like the W3C and like the IETF that vets and validates these standards for both their technical capabilities as well as for their potential for interoperability with other ecosystems. In a world where more than 60% of the individuals who use the internet are running on a variant of Chrome, um, which is the Chromium browser engine, these technologies have a very strong ability to shape what the future of the internet and advertising and tracking may look like. And while they are privacy enhancing technologies, if privacy enhancing technologies like them are adopted uh, at the scale at which they will be adopted, they need a lot more scrutiny than they have received so far. Um, and which is why we've advocated a lot with the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK. Uh, and we've also had, uh, engaged with many other regulators around the world, both privacy and competition, advocating for why processes need to be better. And some of them have included conversations with Google as well. So with that, I'll end and happy to answer any questions. Th thank you, thank you very much, uh, Uptav. I, I think you, you you raised quite a number of points that will that we will definitely need to come back to uh, during our discussion. And one of the points, if I may, because it actually also opens up a little bit the, the door for for the next intervention to some extent. Um, I, oh, but let's say more broadly for all of, of us is the question about the. Um, um, the, the difficulties related to the, you know, validating the technical claims um, and what is actually that means for, for, for the selection and also for policymakers and the regulators that are trying to promote the adoption of, of, of privacy enhancing technologies, but also the issue of interoperability. I think we, uh, this is maybe a topic that I also would like us to discuss about. Um, but what I also find interesting was that you were talking about the current state of the ecosystem, of the advertisement ecosystem, um, and, ra and highlighting that there are obviously some challenges. And I, I think our next speakers, um, um, starting uh, uh, with Max and then Stefan, um, um, will we'll address exactly that, that, that um, state. But what is more interesting, and this is really why I, I look also forward to their uh, presentation, is because they are essentially talking now about a different role of, the, of digital technologies for, for pro, um, um, supporting privacy, which is the enforcement side. So, um, because interestingly, you talked about that a lot of those technologies have played a, gained a, a, a higher adoption because or thanks to the GDPR. Uh, so we have a legal regime in place, um, but apparently um, we will hear what is happening with cookies and how they are being used. And um, so without further ado, I will give you the floor, uh, Max, and uh, I understand you will, you will co-present with Stefan, so I'll let you manage that between the two of you. The floor is yours. And if you may introduce yourself and what your NGO does. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation um, and early morning from Vienna. Um, Stefan is on the second one for practicality reasons. I'm just going to do the presentation myself. Um, Stefan is the developer that actually works on a lot of these things. So if to get it maybe also out of the policy only discussion and maybe some hands on discussion, um, that is especially uh, what Stefan would be here for. So I'm just going to run through our presentation, trying to be as quick as possible. Um, so fundamentally, we um, at NOIP do different enforcement projects. Um, we have like um, kind of deep dives if there's really a big legal issue, uh, but we also see that there's just mass violations. So violations where um, the GDPR is just violated, just like I usually compare it to speeding, where 
you know, it's not a big complicated legal case. <laughs> it's not a big overly dramatic situation, um, but we just see mass violations where people just um, basically do that and, and violate the law um, in, in masses. Um, typically in the privacy or in the even digital community, we're still working on most of that in a rather analog way. Um, typically when lawyers work um, on digital issues, it gets, a, it gets as digital as word usually, and that's about it. Um, so the idea was if we have these hundreds and hundreds of violations, we have to um, speed up, especially we're a small organization with um, being based mainly on donations. So you have to be efficient in what you're doing as well, which is a similar issue for governments as well, I guess. Um, what we thought about on how to approach all of that is a bit like a speeding camera. I can tell you from an Austrian perspective, if you speed in Austria, typically your license plate is automatically read by the speeding camera. The speed is absolutely automatically calculated and it's automatically transferred into a ticket that you would get mailed to you and you basically get a code to pay the fine. There is no human intervention in any of these legal procedures anymore. They're fully automated and that's basically for these standard violations what we do in other areas of the law as well. Because it's just inefficient to have people for that. Now, we thought to kind of take that thinking and apply it to um, the, especially web technologies right now in future plans that could also be used for mobile technologies, for example. And the idea was basically to come up with a multi-step system um, that allows us to generate um, complaints automatically, manage them automatically, and also settle cases with the companies automatically without the need to send hundreds of emails back and forth. Um, this all is in background, basically a big MongoDB, now a PostgreSQL in the file system, all of that lands for the tech geeks. I'm just going to go very roughly to, through the steps of, of how all of this works to make it a bit uh, practical. Uh, what we started one with is OneTrust. Um, it's the biggest provider for cookie banners. So it's kind of the standard cookie banners you at least see in the European Union. Um, they're typically done by four or five big tech, comp uh, bigger um, service providers. Websites usually don't have their own cookie banner. They usually use one of these services. That also allowed us to scale up because we know thousands of websites are using exactly the same software to, to do this cookie banner. And OneTrust actually has a JSON configuration file where most of the configurations of the cookie are stored. So we can actually, or the computer can read it quite well because for example, um, sh this is like the banner show reject all button false. So it basically doesn't show you a reject button on the first layer and you can take it right from the JSON file to know that that is there or not there. Um, same thing for many other of the configurations of a cookie banner. Um, in the background, um, OneTrust provides a interface where um, the admin can change that. So we also took screenshots to explain to the companies what which button they would have to fix to <laughs> make sure that they comply with the GDPR. Um, and that was kind of like the systems, basically the back end and the technology, um, like the technological way of, of saving um, these settings. And that we could basically auto um, collect. We did a first kind of code search. There's a website, for example, called public www, where you can search like you can search on Google. On this, you can search for code in the website. So to see which software a website is using and thereby you get a list of all the so uh, websites that use in this case, the OneTrust cookie banner. Um, and that already allows us to only focus on the websites that actually have it uh, used and not have to scrape the whole web um, for, for random pages to, that actually use OneTrust. Um, what we then have is that we actually first auto scan the website to see if there is any violations. Um, and then we actually have a manual scan where an individual really goes to the website and checks it. We did have like a two screen setup usually where there's a test environment on one side, um, and which was a virtual machine. We're right now changing that. And then you have basically a management interface where you can manage the case yourself. We need to do that also because under the law, we need to have a data subject to someone that is directly concerned uh, to actually bring a case. And um, all of that basically gets you a big fancy list where you can filter all the cases and then take a case and do your assessment. We only filed if the human and the computer basically deci decided that it's a violation. So we have this kind of two people have to agree kind of system to make sure that there's a low um, error rate. Um, once you have done that, we basically auto-generated a complaint, which is text blocks um, that generate a PDF where you have certain elements that are filled automatically, certain elements that turn on and off, depending on which violations you found on the website, basically fed from, from the JSON um, file and, and what you found in that. Uh, we typically then send that to the individual company first. Um, that was one of the biggest issues because um, we had to make sure that they don't think it's them because if you get like there's a legal procedure against you, most people will just throw it away. 
Um, and we even try to um, use kind of some of the systems that the, the companies use. Um, they typically use, for example, A-B testing to figure out which type of interaction works the best. So we A-B B tested that as well and saw for different types of emails we send to the company, we get a better or lower compliance rate. Um, so we thought if they can manipulate the users into clicking the yes button with A-B testing, we can probably manipulate them into compliance with the law. Um, by doing A-B testing, that was kind of the approach there. And as I said, we even have a full guideline on how to be fully compliant. So it was kind of served on a silver spoon, uh, on, on a silver plate um, to actually have that done. If companies actually decided to um, comply with that, they could go to a platform where they could log in with their case number with a password, and then we're able to actually um, let us know that they have fully compliant and that they have fixed the problem. We then automatically um, were able to scan that and prove that. Um, and also from a lawyer's perspective, we were able to get all the feedback from the companies in a automated format. So we didn't have hundreds of emails with some law firms that send you endless text. We basically got that in a structured way, the feedback as well. Now, what's super interesting is if you look at that from a statistical point of view. Um, we were doing the first version, and that's pretty much what I showed to you in more of a duct tape technology version. We just did a first test and saw how well it worked. And what was interesting was two things. Uh, first of all, we had a 42% compliance rate just by sending the companies an email with a specific instruction of what's legal, what's not legal, and that there would be further action taken if they're not compliant. And that was already a huge number. That's better than what we get from the data protection authorities if we're doing cases there. So that was really interesting that we had a very good compliance rate here. Uh, the second thing that was interesting, that's kind of dependent on the violation. I don't go into that, but it's different per violation on, on how good the compliance was. There was only, um, and that's a side note, there was only about 18% that fully compliant because we typically had six or seven violations and they fixed some of them. So the 40% is the overall number of violations. But the really interesting part was the domino effect that came out of it. Uh, typically in law, we do not go after every person and go after everybody that's speeding. We intervene often enough that people feel, oh, speeding can actually be a problem. And what we saw is we scanned about uh, 5,000 pages um, and then actually only sent an email to about 500. When we continued with the rest, we suddenly saw that hundreds of the other websites have all fixed their cookie banner, even though we've never intervened with them. So what happened in the background? Um, companies understood, oh, there is actually no enforcement action going on. I heard that from a colleague. I heard that from the software provider that also sent emails around. And suddenly we saw a huge number of compliance um, without even intervening. And that's exactly this idea of general deterrence that we usually have in other areas of the law that, that work well once you can speed it up and be a credible threat or a credible interference. Um, now, just to wrap it up, um, we also upgrade this now to actually become like a long-term project, which is uh, Stefan's main job right now to get all of that um, in a very structured and very nice way of using it. We also do that in a way that the authorities could use it in the future, um, ideally. What we added is basically a bigger admin panel where you can manage all of these cases and make it all much more modular. So you basically can go between the steps back and forth when it used to be like more linear. Um, that adds a lot of the options to manage cases better and, and, and also attribute cases better and filter cases better. So we can, for example, say we only bring certain cases in anymore. Um, the other thing that we basically do here is that we um, upgrade a lot of the individual functionality that we can actually, the first version was on cookie banners, but you can use that tomorrow for tracking pixels, for some other web technology, some script, anything else. And these modular parts, you can basically put plug into the software and take it back out. Um, that is fundamentally what, what um, this is going to make a lot different. The rest is mainly really making the interfaces usable for an average lawyer so that we don't need a tech person every time you need to change something in a PDF. Um, that is the element that we're working on right now. Um, for us, that was um, really one of the most useful projects I think we've done, um, especially considering like input output ratios and really moving enforcement forward. Um, so on that side, I think it's um, a very interesting approach in, in, in the sense that we're kind of working in a digital sphere but still do kind of pretty analog procedures. <laughs> and we could probably learn from, from a lot of areas on, on how we can do that better. Uh, so thanks for that. And I hope if there's questions, especially technical questions <laughs> that uh, Stefan can jump in on all of these. <laughs> okay, Th thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Um, I think I have probably one, one brief question if you could um, elaborate on that because it will actually also give a 
be a good transition for the next speaker, which is like, I assume that you, I mean, I think you mentioned that you had talked to data protection authorities. Uh, could you briefly say what your, what the kind of feedbacks uh, were that you received on that and how high is the interest among those data protection authorities to implement this kind of tool in their processes? So I think the, the my, on a very personal level, if I may say, I think the answer was, a mix of fear because too much, never seen that um, different world um, and high interest in the sense of really how can we be efficient in our work and also let's say get get rid of useless work for employees in the sense of like a lot of these tiny things are just very trivial. N you don't need a lawyer for a lot of that. Um, and usually I think one element that I forgot to mention, the quality usually gets better because if you have a one-time template that was proven well by you know the more senior people, um, you know that what you're doing here is going to produce good results. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have some, let's say, more junior person that has to do that the first time, you have a very good chance that something is going to go wrong or that something goes, gets forgotten. So it's also, I think, um, efficiency plus quality that you can get through mm -hmm. systems that work well. Mm -hmm. However, the big problem in reality is um, you need to implement that. You need to have programmers. You need to have people that really understand that. And you need to have the management skills for it in the sense of to really find the right cases because this doesn't work for every case. Um, a big thing also with us was um, to not get entangled into details anymore, to really tell the lawyers, we're only doing these two things. There may be 10 other violations on the website, which we just ignore them for now because we can't, that doesn't scale. Um, and that is a bit of a, let's say, culture change that you need as well, even, even with Inuit to um, say, okay, that is really a thing where we just go for these, this one topic, we do that well and mm. quick. And the next time we do the next topic, um, which is a very different approach than yeah. in procedures where we usually do everything. Cool. I, I think it, it just is to highlight, um, and I've noted that because it's a good topic for, for the later discussion, because you just mentioned the word scale. And I think this is definitely one of the common themes uh, when it comes to using technologies for addressing privacy problems that we have a potential, let's say, solution, not, or let's say a support of a solution, or part of the solution that basically helps us uh, scale with the scale um, of the problem, so to speak. Uh, but we will get to that point, uh, hopefully. Um, now it um, is uh, my pleasure to, to give the floor to the European Data Protection Supervisor. And um, I guess obviously one, one particular question given um, uh, Wojciech that you are following uh, Mark's presentation is the question um, to what extent are these tools uh, relevant for, for your agency but also for um, your basically the, your colleagues' um, agencies. And, um, and maybe also in talk about the role of privacy or technologies more broadly uh, for, for supporting your work and your cause. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me there. Thank you for being able to uh, talk with you even in, in such a early morning uh, here in Brussels. Uh, so all the best from Brussels. Uh, first few words uh, on the institution itself, the European Data Protection Supervisor. I guess most of you are um, familiar with it, but uh, for those who first time hear about the very complicated system um, of the governance of uh, privacy in, in Europe, the European Data Protection Supervisor is the supervisor of the EU, Euro European Union institutions, uh, bodies and agencies. So I'm not the super, uh, super data protection commissioner for uh, all Europe, but I'm the commissioner for the uh, EU bodies and EU, uh, EU institutions. At the same time, we have this uh, 27, member, uh, 27 member states uh, jurisdictions and 27 data protection commissioners uh, in uh, each of the member states. Some of them have even more complicated uh, structure. Anyway, uh, what is rather more important for the, today's discussion is not our supervisory role towards the EU institutions, but the fact that we are advisors in the uh, legislative process in the European Union, and also the fact that we are the providers of the secretariat for the European Data Protection Board, which is consisting of all these uh, data protection authorities. Uh, so I, I'm, not, I'm not speaking in the name of all these authorities, uh, but I can somehow uh, provide you with the approach that uh, we have among the European data protection uh, authorities. Uh, well, that's a good idea to, to put me just after Max because I can uh, uh, somehow react to what he said about the um, uh, resonance uh, that uh, his work makes uh, among the data protection authorities and uh, in the market. That's true that there are a lot of data protection authorities who are interested in the practical 
practical deployment of the solutions similar to the ones that NOIBS does. That's also true that for some data protection authorities, it's strange that the NGO, the civic society movement, can do the things which are called enforcement, but actually the disenforcement. That is, that is the way to make the, the, the thing running. And, and to, I'm saying that also as the person who uh, always said that uh, what Max did in his life uh, was the thing that the data protection commissioners should do 10 years before, and they never asked the right questions. Anyway, uh, coming back to the, uh, to the main point of uh, uh, discussion, uh, that's true that these very tools that are prepared by NOIP, including also the information retrieval systems, which are, uh, which are connected with it, uh, are the things that should exist in most of the data protection authorities, especially those uh, that, uh, are, uh, that have really independent uh, IT structure from the other, from the other institutions. Uh, we rather try, as data protection authorities, we are, are rather try to deal with the legal and guidelines way of uh, doing the things. But it's true that some of the data protection authorities do have their laboratories and do have their IT teams that are preparing the tools as well. We try to do it as the European Data Protection Supervisor as well, because we still re uh, remember that there, are, there is a kind of limit for the legislative actions that we can do. Uh, the, the making more law does not necessarily help. What actually, uh, the, the point on which we are in the European Union is that we have the law, and the law is not bad. The thing is that we have to operationalize it uh, also by uh, promoting uh, the role of the IT architects and promotion of the comprehensive privacy engineering approach. So the, the, that is something which uh, lies in the, in the uh, in the roots of our strategy as the EDPS and uh, for this uh, mandate strategy, shaping the safer digital future, a new strategy for the new decade, uh, we, uh, as one of the uh, pillars, put the tools, the tools, so we are going to use the tools and we are going to develop the new ones. And of course, uh, uh, as I said, it's not that easy for all the data protection authorities to uh, create the laboratory where these uh, tools are uh, uh, really uh, are, are really produced, but the, the uh, authorities like ICO, like NIL, like uh, Canadian authority, like uh, um, uh, the like G G some of the German authorities uh, are ready to do it and are ready to uh, to uh, uh, to prepare their own tools. What we do as EDPS, apart from the very small things uh, connected with the remote uh, uh, control and the remote audits, uh, 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 we try to uh, organize the society. We have the IPEN, which is Internet Privacy Engineering Network, which is a platform for engineers uh, that are preparing the PET solutions uh, to discuss on them and also to disseminate information about different uh, uh, solutions uh, which are done uh, by different organizations. Uh, but we also try to um, make use of the fact that the um, European Union is European Union institutions, that 70 institutions which have their own achievements in this uh, field. And let me here just uh, give two examples of uh, such uh, uh, solutions, which are both coming from the Eurostat, which is the statistical office, uh, and the agency which is dealing with statistics in the European uh, Union. And uh, they are both also given us in examples in the um, in the current uh, uh, current guide on privacy enhancing technologies uh, for official statistics, uh, which uh, have been produced by the United uh, by the United Nations. So the first one is the processing of uh, longitudinal uh, mobile network operator data, where the uh, where Eurostat has developed the proof concept solution with a technology provider now, with the main goal um, of this project is to explore the feasibility of uh, secure private computing solutions uh, for privacy uh, preserving uh, processing uh, of uh, mobile network operator data. Uh, the, the technology itself uh, is uh, the, 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 for the project was uh, a trusted execution environment uh, with the hardware 
um, isolation which has been de delivered uh, by the market. So this is not only the uh, Eurostat who is preparing that Eurostat is uh, deploying it uh, um, and and uh, let's say localizing it, uh, but uh, the uh, but the um, business is involved in it. And the second one, uh, also from the uh, from Eurostat, uh, is uh, a developing of trusted smart surveys. And once again, that's the situation in which uh, the uh, um, which Eurostat is uh, trying to uh, um, localize uh, on the IT infrastructure for the EU institutions uh, the solution which is prepared uh, for the market. So these are the things that we develop. These are the things that we tr try to promote, and this is a kind of uh, um, um, a kind of uh, culture which we try to uh, deploy uh, among the clerks of the quite Byzantine institution as the European Union administration is. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Just a question, because I think what, what I liked about the examples that you pointed out was that you are essentially directing, um, um, or your, your speech was basically directing us towards um, a solution, how to promote the use of those different technologies. Um, and you gave also examples of, um, uh, let's say, data protection authorities that were kind of um, leading the way. Um, I was wondering also um, if you could um, talk a little bit about uh, the importance of, of guidance in that particular role, um, given that, uh, or maybe we can talk about that when we, when we um, later on, when we talk about uh, solutions, how to promote that, because obviously this is where um, the UKICO guidance um, plays a role. So let, let's put it on the side because I, I, re I just realized that time is running and uh, we need to, to move on, sorry, uh, to our next speaker. Um, so, um, and here obviously, I would say maybe we just uh, start and give you the floor, uh, 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 to, to maybe introduce yourself and introduce your, 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 your organization and what it does. Um, and how it relates actually to the to the discussion about um, technology and the role of technology for privacy protection. I think one of the key elements, at least from my understanding, is that what you are doing is helping us um, scale with the problem and help us address some of the 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 the, the issues related to yeah privacy. Um, but I let you I let you talk and uh, and yep. introduce yourself. So uh, I'll just share my screen as well, so everybody can see, and then we can talk. So I am Suchakra. I am chief scientist of this uh, upstart, nice uh, little upstart called Privado. And uh, what we are trying to do is to look at PETs from a very different perspective. Uh, the way PETs have been developed right now is that the solution providers are using it or the way privacy itself generally is, is looked at is from the perspective of user. Uh, but what we are thinking is that uh, data is not uh, floating in the ether everywhere. It is, it is moving from one system to another system by software. So why not just look at the software itself which is handling the data? it can give you an interesting perspective of what was the intention of the developer when they were developing the software. And then you can track what is happening. So, so essentially we are trying to catch uh, privacy violations before even they manifest inside the system. So even before you release software, you can actually understand how it's going to handle data. And if you do it at all the points uh, in the chain of where the software is handling the data, that, that's where it would be. So, you know, like as Max was pointing out, you know, automating everything, a ticketing system. So that ticketing system is using a software. When it takes a photo of a of, of a car, uh, it captures some some information. That's private information, and then it translates into a ticket, which goes through five six systems behind. Those are all points where data is flowing. How about we understand that whole system in, in system itself, and then we can predict what's going to happen to the data. So that's the perspective. Um, so I'm Suchakra, I'm the chief scientist here. Uh, I have a PhD in computer engineering, have been working in cybersecurity for six years, something now, and almost two years now in privacy. I'm going to implement all the learnings that I have from the cybersecurity industry in, in this uh, environment now. Okay, so visiting a doctor, this is how you, you 
do it these days. You know, you fill up a form, you have a lot of private information there, PHI information. Doctor looks at it, keeps it safe for some time, you know, and then it gets shredded, you know, hopefully. Uh, but now we have something new in, the, in this millennium. We have a software and, and the software is now handling your data. So things have not changed much, but now with the advent of this software, what has happened is that this data gets uh, uh, exchanged through multiple hands, you know, goes to logs, gets to an advertiser. You don't even know what that software is doing. You just trust it. You go to a doctor's office, you fill in the details, you just trust it. But what's happening behind, and this is true because we have observed software, we have analyzed it. We know that it's using a lot of technologies that proliferate this data. So essentially what happens is at the development time of the software, you have no data. You just have the intention of what, what, can, what to do with the data. But as the software gets deployed, you know, some of the data gets put into an analytics service, some goes to a third party, and then databases everywhere. The data expands, you know, so it's it's nice uh, if we try to look at the software itself, because that's where the intention of what to do with the data is. And, and you can actually do it. So what happens to your data is actually defined in software. So at the time when the software is built or it's getting deployed in those locations, we can get information about data inventory, uh, doctor's name, patient's name, et cetera. We can get a map of the data. The intention of the software is to take the patient's name and put it to this analytic service uh, based on where the data is, is going to be stored. For example, the data that it's taken and it's going to be put in a data center in US East, you can actually get the location of where the data will be. And again, there's no data that is being processed. It's just the intention of what to do with the data. Uh, or third party transfers. So if that doctor software has some weird connection which goes to some other connection, goes to another piece of software, and that is using advertising, you can actually track it all the way. And this gives uh, us something which I would like to call as technically very verifiable PIAs. So every, every organization tries to do PIAs, private, privacy impact assessments, but that cycle is too long. They, you know, there are documents that have to be filled and then you go back to the engineers, they, you go back to the developers, and then, you know, the lawyers also get involved. They want to see the document in a specific format. But what if you, you have all this information very early on in the game? So if you try to do it at that stage, it's easy, it's early, and it's proactive privacy. If you try to do it at later stages, try to understand where the data went and use you know, 10 other technologies, it's, it's a little bit late at that time. So this is one kind of PET that we would like to say. It's, it's kind of like expansion of, of uh, PETs by actually making the software itself secure, you know, making the software itself not leak your private information in many places. Okay, so one example is uh, in, in Canada, you know, I, I'm, I'm in Toronto right now, it's, it's pretty late and uh, there is, a direct directive which is uh, released by the government on privacy impact assessments. And we see that all the organizations have to actually fill in this PIAs, go through a process. And uh, Canada had this dental benefit, you know, last year, and they created a summary. And there's a small text which fulfills one of the points here, which says individuals submit their personal information, you know, on the CRA, the Can Canadian Revenue Agency website, it's using HTTPS and et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's about it. And to get this kind of assessment, they would have been going through multiple places, looking at previous assessments, looking at software, but software changes so rapidly. The moment you introduce a new kind of dental benefit or a vaccination plan, or, you know, this is rapid. So the software gets developed rapidly and you never know what went inside it. But you have all this information, we discussed that. This is already there because when the software was developed, we know what, what is supposed to happen to the data. So what if you can, so imagine like before even making that kind of a service public, what if you could find whether it's collecting your PII, PHI and it's trans transmitting it to some other weird you know, service that you never imagined. These days it can be open AI LLMs and you can actually do it. And, and we have built a tool which is also open source, you should check it out, uh, which allows you to really identify that if a developer decided to collect uh, address, you know, inside the software, it can say new data element found, this is at this exact place, 
if it's a violation, if it's a privacy violation, fix it very early on. You know, you don't have to uh, wait for a big assessment and then going back. You can immediately know that, yeah, in today, this developer sat down and they decided to collect address information. And you have this information right there in itself. And you can then see the flow, where it went. You can actually analyze the software, you know, just like a human is writing, our tool tries to analyze uh, you know, that software to see the intention of the human. And you can see that that will eventually go to OpenAI, it will go to a MongoDB uh, database somewhere, uh, or it gets leaked to a console, which again is a privacy issue. People don't understand, but it is a very big privacy issue. So uh, you can get this deeper understanding just by looking at code, because code has the intention of what the developer wanted to do with the data. So. That's essentially what it is. And having these technically verifiable PIA opens a new door. You get a chain of trust. So this accountability perspective also comes into picture here. You get a chain of trust because you, you have a record of modifications right from the design to development and to deployment. You have an opportunity to certify software now. You can have privacy certified applications because you know that this application is handling private data in a more secure manner. They have not integrated these uh, you know, weird advertising things inside them. Uh, you can try and translate privacy intentions of like legal directives that we were seeing, big documents, into very fine grained checks which are followed. This, this can open doors to actually understand high level laws, you know, like GDPR, CCPA, and the nuances in them, and convert them to really fine checks that that uh, can be run on software to say that, yeah, this is compliant with it. And this is even before it gets deployed. So, you know, kind of like automating what Max is trying to do in a, in a manner, but doing it very, very early, you know, even before the software gets developed. Uh, uh, and then, you know, it again opens a paradigm for privacy engineers. They can now proactively help build privacy respecting apps because privacy engineering gets involved. It's a new role that should be there. It's, it's very important. Uh, and they can help build privacy respecting app. Mm -hmm. But what we have also observed is it cannot replace human processes. You know, it, they, they are absolutely essential. Uh, so what if there's no policy to shred the document? You can do as much nice things as possible on the software side, but uh, that's that's essentially uh, what it is. Um, yeah, that's that's about it. Uh, questions? Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Sushakar. I was actually, um, and I also thank you very much for making the connection to the previous presentation by Max. And obviously, one of the questions that I was wondering if if is this is also an approach that theoretically NGOs could use to, or privacy advocates could use to, to kind of, um, yeah, enforce a privacy law, or even, and obviously also data protection authorities could use when they are doing um, in-house screening and to, to, to or impact assessment or, and the likes. But obviously we also have a, a set of professions um, that are operating within the firms. And I would say uh, this is a good link to our next speaker, uh, Nicole, so if you could introduce yourself and um, and how your work and your experience relates to 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 what the previous speakers have said. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. I feel really honored and delighted to be following such a wonderful group of presenters. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Nicole Stevenson, and I'm a partner at IIS Partners, which is an Australian privacy and data protection consultancy. And we're in our 20th year of operation. Um, you'll also hear from my accent that I am a Canadian, which means I'm both a Canadian and an Australian citizen, but I've been living here in Australia for 20 years now. Uh, I lead our privacy services functions at IIS Partners, where my specialism is in privacy program management and culture building. Uh, so you can just, you can sort of picture how I'm potentially going to wrap up today's session. And I'd like to really start with the essence of my interventions in mind and put to the group that privacy enhancing technology should not replace good decision making at the outset. So our governments and organizations still have a positive duty to ensure that their information practices accord with relevant privacy and data protection laws and community expectations. Now, in my work, there is a large focus on strategic privacy risk management, which is natural, right? Because 
the work of a privacy consultant often relates to identifying and mitigating risk around decisions that have already been taken. So for example, organizational information policy or practice projects or programs, and then of course, technology deployments. And sometimes I find that our governments and organizations can be educated on what their risks are, but particularly where there are large volumes of personal data or complex vendor relationships involved, they might struggle to solve for these using conventional methods. So as an example, where there's a risk of unauthorized disclosure of personal data into those vendor processing environments, such as through vendor APIs or single sign-on digital handshakes, it can be quite difficult for organizations to test whether a risk exists only in the realm of possibility, right? And we often see those types of risks borne out in privacy impact assessments, right? Consultants like me say, oh, you might have a risk of uh, unauthorized disclosure here. But is that in, only in the realm of possibility or is it actually playing out in reality? Now, unauthorized disclosures to vendors that are processing personal data on an organization's behalf often happen without any real awareness of the organization. And um, we refer to this, or we often refer to this as data leakage, but this is also really highly likely to qualify as a personal data breach, right? Depending on the jurisdiction that you're in. And although I'm a huge proponent of administrative controls like contracts, data leakage isn't something that a contract with a vendor is going to illuminate properly, right? Or even control for sufficiently at the outset. Um, all of you know, right, when we are remediating data breaches, this is actually a backward looking exercise. This is where I think privacy enhancing technologies do have a deep potential utility. Now, in the context of controlling for data leakage, so let's use this as our sort of example space, privacy enhancing technologies are probably going to take the form of data accountability tools. And this is more of a gray area category for, for pets, right? As compared with some of the technologies that have been discussed already here today, um, where technology can assist an organization to enforce rules about what should or should not happen to personal data. And the rules are gonna be found in things like our data protection laws that are applicable to the organization. Or they might be set out and or they might be set out uh, as commitments to the community in the context of an organization's privacy policy, or they might be expressed as contractual provisions between the organization and its various vendors or service providers. Now, all of this said though, the implementation of privacy enhancing technologies doesn't remove from our governments or organizations those initial accountabilities that are associated with things like purpose specification. You know, why do we need the data in the first place? Do we have a fit and proper purpose for collecting and using it. And then of course that collection minimization. Are we only collecting the personal data that we need to fill that proper purpose? Uh, because these are those vital building blocks, right? For enforcing a climate or a culture that limits use and disclosure of personal data to the greatest extent possible with or without the involvement of privacy enhancing technologies. Now, all of that said, right? And in my experience, the business case for implementing privacy enhancing technologies, uh, at least as I've seen here in Australia, can be complicated by a number of factors, including whether the pet supplier is a small business or startup, right? Because they themselves might lack the necessary privacy or cyber maturity. I'm not saying that's in all cases, but it can certainly be in many cases, particularly where there's not that sort of uh, bucket of vendor capital sitting behind the small business or startup. Second is the geographical location of the pet supplier. And there are many sort of associated legal requirements or barriers that might impact an organization or government's ability to engage that pet supplier. And there might also be some socio-political biases depending on where that, um, that supplier is. You know, in, uh, if, if we look at privacy in the sort of Western conceptualization of privacy, if we're looking at a potential pet supplier that's based somewhere that doesn't have those same socio-political norms or ideals, that might be a barrier. Um, and finally, budget of the government agency or organization. Um, one thing that we're noticing is that where privacy enhancing technologies are dealing with large volumes of data, if um, they are being priced based on units of data or volume of data, sometimes the, the budget can you know, blow out and, and really remove from the government agency or organization the ability to use that technology at all. Now, I wanted to share with you that 
IIS Partners recently established a subsidiary company, and it's called TrustWorks 360. And that's because we think privacy enhancing technologies are a thing and are an important thing in Australia and in the wider global market. And so TrustWorks 360 is working to bring privacy enhancing technologies and other privacy and security management solutions to the ANZ and Asia PAC market, um, which is where we play. Um, and the feedback so far has been that it's a real challenge. Um, I approached actually one of our, our privacy enhancing technology partners when I was um, considering the comments that I would bring to the group today. They are called Q Privacy, and they deploy tools that both allow organizations to audit for data leakage. So remembering that context, that example I gave you before, um, and then also establish and enforce rules that ensure only the personal data specified for a processing purpose is able to be pulled into those vendor environments. Now, I think that this type of data accountability tool is exciting for the global privacy marketplace. And I, I think it's got great utility for organizations that deal with large volumes of data that can't possibly be monitored by a person, right? And in these cases, and from a, with my consulting hat on, I would say that automated solutions are much more ideal, right, than relying on, say, the privacy officer or the DPO in an organization to try to get a handle on this. But there are barriers to uptake. And when I asked Q Privacy to share what, in their experience, those barriers are, they, they gave me um, a couple of points to share with the room. The first is that there seems to be a low priority for um, uptake of pets in you know, sort of your small to medium organizations or your smaller governments, because there's such a focus on big tech from a regulatory perspective. And if everybody's eyes are on big tech, um, it means that no one sees what we're doing over here, right? So we're sort of risk managing our decisions in relation to privacy, uh, possibly waiting for a data breach before we take action on anything. Second is that there tends to be an avoidance for zero trust approaches to um, personal information or personal data management of the likes that, um, that Q Privacy is um, deploying and low budgets. And so there tends to be uh, more of a focus on those third-party risk assessment tools and using standard legal contracts and treating those as sufficient. Um, and finally, the most decision makers in the domain of privacy tend to be um, more in that legal space, right? So we tend to see uh, legal teams or potentially corporate services teams dealing with privacy issues for the government or their organizations and they have a less technical focus. So, you know, the barrier, the lack of privacy engineers or folks that understand how privacy enhancing technologies um, is a barrier for uptake. And with that, because I know we wanna have at least 15 minutes for questions, uh, I will, I'll end my discussion here. And again, thank you to all of you and to the room for attending today. Thank you, thank you very much, Nicole. And I think you pointed out um, a number of questions that I would like us to discuss. Um, just wanted to invite the, the audience in the room, but as well online to, to feel free to raise questions. Um, but um, given, I mean, I have a couple of them, <laughs> so I will take my, my privilege as a moderator maybe to ask a few of them. And um, I mean, one is definitely the question about adoption that was raised. Um, if we all agree that all those technologies are great, um, why is it that we are not, not everyone is using it? I mean, uh, some of these technologies have been around for a long time. Um, so how comes that um, it still seems to be something exotic that needs to be discussed at the IGF? Um, so this would be my number one question. And another one, if I may, and then, um, because it, that's actually the one that strikes me out of the discussion, kind of everyone has, Agreed, seems to agree that automation is great, it, it, great it, it's needed to scale with the problem uh, um, clearly. Um, but at the same time, everyone seems to be saying, or at least I heard this multiple times, um, humans should not be replaced. There should be a role for humans to be kept in the process. So if you could elaborate on that, because I think that's maybe something that may, some people may, um, yeah, for different reasons, um, try to forget. Oh, Ignore. So I let I let you maybe intervene. Um, we, we we start maybe with Clara, and we keep the orders of intervention. If you could address some of these points, um, put the emphasis where you w wish to do. So Clara, if you could could start, and maybe sorry um, before you do, 
I just wanted to acknowledge uh, and express my appreciation that you are joining, uh, some of you at least are joining uh, from very earl, um, early mo in the morning, in particular Yushu Shukra from, from Canada, so this is very much appreciated. Oh, well, it's, it's starting to get light, you can see in the background. <laughs> Nearly normal morning now. Uh, I think I'll take your first one um, uh, about like why do we not see it ingrained yet. Uh, it's something that we're working on at the ICO. It's our next step after the privacy enhancing technologies guidance. And I think basically our explanation for this is that the organizations who would most benefit from privacy enhancing technologies do not yet know that they exist. So there's a real interest in them in community. Um, and that's where the use cases are going. Um, is my sound okay? Is it a bit Your sound is okay. You, the, the video is freezing a little bit, but we can hear you uh, well. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, basically the kind of lower tech organizations are not yet aware of these technologies. And one of the things that we're working on is how can we bring um, people who are more expert in pets, so pets developers, academics, organizations who are more technically minded, who have already implemented them, together with more traditional organizations, local government, health bodies, to really understand like, why would you use a pet? Um, so that, that's my explanation for question one. And I'll hand over. Okay, so. Um, I think that on the point of question two and uh, why humans are important and it's not just a question of uh, automation. Uh, I, there, I There is a very real risk that we also often discuss within Mozilla that privacy enhancing technologies may make it so that people just start collecting even more data than they already do because it's so easy to collect it and you can, like a lot of the risks that are associated with it no longer exist. And um, I, it, independent of the technology that is being deployed or whether you're using a tool to check code or whether you're trying to like make sure that data leaks don't take place. I think it's really important for organizations to first question, should this kind of data be collected in the first place? Mm -hmm. Is there a real use for it? What use to will it be put for? Is it worth the risk of what may happen if this data um, uh, ends up leaking uh, as much as they invest in resources and tools in order to protect that information? And for me, at least, that's the primary reason why human beings are mm. important, because the decisions of what to collect are obviously made by human beings. Mm. Uh, if uh, you are collecting more information than you need and it ends up leaking, rather than investing in the tooling around preventing that from happening, maybe you should reconsider whether that data should have been collected in the first place or not. Um, and I think that um, th it's been a very enlightening conversation also because there are two parts, right? Like one is privacy enhancing technologies once the data exists within an organization. But there is also the piece uh, of privacy enhancing technologies that allow you to collect data without the parts that actually sometimes even make it private, mm. um, which are identifiable information. So for example, both of the things that I had mentioned, Oblivious, HTTP, and um, uh, DAP, allow you to collect information in a manner that is aggregated, equally useful, but with mm. almost zero consequence to what happens if like that entire piece ends up being in the real world because it's been collected in a manner where the unique identifiers no longer correspond uh, to um, the people who would actually mm. operate them. Mm. So I think like, that's also an interesting point to keep in mind yeah, for the yeah. first one. Thank you. Um, Max, if you could address that point. I would actually just, Stefan would probably go first. <laughs> okay, Stefan. Um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, from my uh, professional uh, experience coming from other companies, it's just way easier, cheaper, and people just don't mind if they collect a lot of privacy data, because if you start thinking about PTs and stuff like that, first, uh, the knowledge is like, the knowledge is there or very old, but it's like much easier if you just like store everything and uh, don't care about uh, the, the the possible impact of, of, of what you're doing there, and therefore management normally goes by do it the cheapest way, and the cheapest way is not to care about privacy. Also, there is the GDPR uh, in place, but like the chance, it like like it's it's more a risk based approach, <laughs> so that you rather say uh, we store everything and we hope for the best that it's not gonna leak. Thank you. Max, do you want to add something? Yeah, I would add two things. Um, first, on, on what Stefan just said, I, I also see that in practice when we see uh, privacy and technologies 
it's oftentimes a bit of a camouflage. So in actual litigation, we oftentimes see is like, oh, we did something absolutely legal, but hey, we had a hash in between. Um, so <laughs> that's typically in litigation when you when it actually appears in reality in the in the wild, so to say. Mm. Um, so that is that that I would echo there. Um, the the parts where you need a human because that was part of your question is, for example, in cookie banners, we could compare the colors of, of buttons, but the question was, is the color choice deceptive or not? And that is contextual, depends on the situation. Red and green would probably make sense for yes and no, but white and gray and, and green probably not, and the computer is not really able to, to necessarily get the context there. Uh, so that is the stuff that we definitely always had with a human. Uh, but if all the rest that you're doing is already done by the computer, you can focus on that one question, click the button, say yes or no, and that's it, and you basically make, make the human do the one thing that they can actually do well in that situation. Uh, one last thing that just came from um, the, the presentation uh, before what I thought was interesting is, I mean, we know, for example, for financial institutions, for like automatic um, analytics of computers and so on, uh, of software and so on, that financial institutions, for example, usually run the whole finances of a big company through a big software <laughs> to make sure that you know there's weird transactions going some weird places. No one physically goes through that anymore. So that would also be interesting, mm. uh, maybe for for speakers thereafter, if that is a realistic approach for the DPAs as well to say, okay, we're not going to do an on-site inspection going through every line, but we bring our own software tool that can you know, go through stuff, but that is mainly a technical question if that exists maybe for speakers thereafter. Um, I just always like to look at other areas of the law, like typically um, what the tax authorities do. Um, it's, it's, it's similar problems, very big volumes of information, but you have to get the one violation in it. Um, so I was wondering if that could be an idea or a thought. No, thank you, uh, Max. And actually what I liked about your point about the example of the financial sector, it actually um, kind of inspired me to the question about certification, whether we need actually something like this, because obviously if there is such a process going on that would scan through software, um, maybe there is a role to play for, for certification, but we may go to that point um, if we have time. Um, I would like to, to invite uh, Wojciech if you could, could, could answer um, or address the question if you like. Yes, very, very shortly for both of the questions. If we think about the problems to, to deploy uh, privacy enhancing technologies, I would say from the public uh, institution point of view and mm. public sector point of view, uh, you, apart from the problem of the lack of awareness of existence of, of pets, which of course exists, uh, we have two other big problems that we are sometimes forgetting about. First, the management of the public institution are usually not the IT persons. They are not uh, usually not engineers even. They're very often, these are the people with the legal or, or humanistic uh, uh, education. And to, to explain to them what the software does, what the solution does, what the technology is for, is not an easy thing. So that's the, definitely the place for the data protection authorities and the uh, NGOs and the civic society to, to deal with. But there is a second problem which we sometimes forget about, which is the lack of proper pro, uh, procurement uh, procedures. So procurement does not allow us uh, to give the, the, the additional points for the fact that pets are used. Hmm. And that's something which uh, is often forgotten. For the second question uh, about automation and the human decision at the same time, well, of course, the balance, because we like automation. We like the fact that we are going to the shop and we, wanna, we want to buy um, uh, not paying the whole price, uh, and we are checked and we got the credit score. I know that uh, Max will joke because uh, uh, there are very few countries where the, it, it works well, but there are the countries like that. And we are happy of getting the positive uh, uh, scoring. We are not happy when we, when we are getting the negative one. So this is the possibility to have the, uh, the, the human intervention, which is the most important uh, and which is the most uh, um, desired. Not necessarily the fact that that uh, we're trying to, to get something for credit, we, uh, I would uh, have to wait for the human decision in each and every case. Mm. Um, thank you for, 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 for making the point. And, and actually one thing that when listening to you, and, and this came up actually by, uh, when Max talked about the, the shades of gray, when I was just wondering like, will AI change things? Will, will then once people have access to AI, 
would that be the point where human decision making won't be needed in, along, in, in that process? Um, just uh, thinking out loud, but uh, maybe I give the floor to, to uh, Shushakar if you could intervene um, here yep. as well. So I think uh, I have discussed this and uh, last year, uh, whole year, having been talking to a lot of organizations, big organizations and apps and tools that you all use, you know, everybody in the room is using and I have talked to folks there. Uh, the push actually comes when there are regulations, standards and fines. Without that, nobody wants to push one, uh, you know, penny above in, in this. So if you go to these organizations and you talk about, hey, you know, if you don't use this security tool, you know, you will be hacked. They are going to do it tomorrow, but they are not going to do it for pet because they can write in some document that we are okay to collect it, collect this data. And you have signed this that, yeah, it's fine that I, I give permission to, you know, collect whatever data. Uh, so they somehow have like a coverage. It doesn't sound too interesting for them. So the only way they move uh, these organizations, which are doing massive data collection, and I have seen it, uh, you know, looking at websites and looking at apps and dissecting them, uh, that they will only move when their regulations, uh, their standards that are defined and their fines. Without that, uh, they don't move. That, that's, I think, what I have seen. And we should all accept it. You know, when you go in a car, all the software that goes inside a car is verified and checked. It goes through a standard. There are MISRA, AutoSAR. These standards are there for critical applications. So privacy should be critical now at this point. And there should be standards that should be developed, evolved, regulation that should be said mm -hmm. about the humans. So we have to make humans uh, believe that this is important so that they can pay. You know, I think that's, that's the role that humans should <laughs> take and they should understand that, okay, this is important and that's why we need humans. That's all I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nicole, if you could, if you could add your point. Look, I, my Canadian colleague is singing my song right now. Um, in in terms of the 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 first part of the question, which is in terms of barriers, I I actually think that there are a couple of levers that we can always pull in government and with our organizations, and that is innovation and information security. You pull those levers, and you can pretty much get access to a bucket of cash to deploy whatever you would like if you if you have a business case for it whereas with privacy it seems to be that that uh, there is a view of privacy as a a block on innovation a block on progress a showstopper the office of no whatever you want to whatever you want to call us in terms of um, the advocacy that we provide within our organizations if if privacy teams who are aware of and interested in deploying privacy enhancing technologies to solve a problem within the organization can access those levers of innovation and information security, get into the room with those people, be part of those steering committees, move up to the executive in a coordinated way, I think that there's a real opportunity to break down some of those barriers and, and show how privacy is an essential part of the organizational ecosystem. So that's my answer to the first question. And, and the second, um, in terms of, I guess, I don't wanna say human in the loop because that's not the way that these decisions are made in relation to privacy enhancing technologies, but the involvement of humans is important because of accountability. So the way government is structured worldwide and the way our organizations are structured, the buck still stops with the executive and the board, right? Or, uh, you know, however they are termed within the organization. So if a person hasn't been involved in making a decision about deployment or configuring the deployment of a privacy enhancing technology to suit the organization, it's really hard then to call anyone to the floor in terms of accountability. You know, in the, in the event of a data breach or in the event of regulatory scrutiny where an organization is asked, you know, you know open the kimono, show us what you've been doing in relation to privacy you want a person there having been part of that decision. Thank, thank you. I mean, we are, we are now heading towards the end. Um, I have maybe one important question, which is um, because we are obviously um, using this event also to inspire some of the work that we are doing at the OECD. And this is maybe the opportunity, given that I don't see any questions from the floor, 
Um, what would you wish the OECD to do, basically, to tackle this topic further? So if you could give a short um, statement on that so that we can move on um, and go where we want this whole topic um, and, uh, to evolve. So I will start again with uh, uh, Clara and, um, and then, yes. Thanks. Um, so I know that pets were presented as a sort of the start of a story and the story is going on, but my pitch would be, I don't think the work on pets is finished yet. I think most organizations are not aware that they exist and there's so much more data sharing or the free flow of data of trust that could happen enabled by pets that is not currently happening. So I would definitely uh, ask for the OECD to continue their efforts in this area. Okay, thank you. Um, I definitely echo that and also say that if there is one thing about pets, apart from uh, organizations that collect data not being aware of it, it's also, I think, regulators not understanding the true scope of what pets can and cannot do. Where the cannot do is also really important, yeah. but even the yeah. can do is quite important as well. And given the fact that OECD is a body, one of its primary functions is really to study, analyze, and engage with governments of member states, uh, spreading awareness at the government level of what these technologies are capable of, of how governments can adopt them, uh, of how governments can make sure that uh, entities that they regulate are uh, aware of them and mm. can improve and deploy them, fund research into them, is, yeah. I would imagine, one of the biggest things the OECD could do. Thank you. Max? Um, to make it super short, I would probably echo that, and I think like um, the like best practices would be really interesting as well. Um, mm. Also, not necessarily only from the privacy sphere. I think one of the biggest problems we have in this discussion is we're only looking what anybody else in the privacy bubble did. Yeah. But oftentimes a lot of this issue exists for 200 years in another bubble. <laughs> so it may oftentimes make sense to look, as I said, you know, financial regulators. Uh, we thought of the speeding ticket as a way, and there's probably a hundred yeah. other thing, ways of thinking about that and to look into that as well. Cool. Thank you. Yes, Wojciech? Well, I actually think that your guidelines on emerging uh, privacy enhancing technologies, current regulatory and police approaches, uh, which you produced uh, in March this year, are the very good example of the uh, things which I would especially, uh, um, uh, maybe not expect, it's not the right word, but uh, that uh, I think that the OECD may be very good in. Mm. Because that this is the, the study which makes uh, um, comparison between the solutions that uh, exist in different places and proposals that uh, are there. But this is not only the, the matrix and the, the, the mapping of the uh, initiatives, but also the proposal how to go to find the convergence in them. And I would really uh, underline this word convergence. This is not interoperability of the solutions. <laughs> That's making them better and making the, 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 the good uh, a level of that. So that, that's something which OECD, I think, is really very good in. And uh, e e even uh, not, not having all the countries of the world in OECD uh, does not uh, uh, harm these uh, studies. Thank you. Shushakra? Yeah, I would just echo what uh, Udbhav said. So, you know, essentially, whatever he said, that's uh, exactly what I would echo. And I would add one more point to it, uh, is that there could be a way where uh, you know, when we go to a lot of these, uh, um, some of our customers, enterprises, and all these organizations who want uh, some some sort of privacy, and they're they're in a very nascent stage sometimes, uh, they ask us about, okay, what is ex what exact technology should I use? How many vendors are there? Who is building what? Like they want this kind of information. So if if we can have like a technical package for these people that, oh, you have this problem. Here are these 10 solutions that can be applied. You have this, this problem, here are these 20 solutions that can be applied. So if we, if we have like this nice paper around this that can be circulated, it would help, I would say. Um, thank you. If I may just take the opportunity to say that some of this is actually what is in the ICO guidance. So, um, but next, next speaker, Nicole, and then we will close uh, the session. Yes, I think just building on that last comment, there, there is a tendency for topics like privacy enhancing technology to be quite impenetrable for organizations and governments, right? folks who are not technical, who are not engineers, uh, who may not even be policy people right? with an awareness of what privacy enhancing technologies do. Finding a way to capture what they are in plain language, almost like a sales pamphlet, 
You know, these are these are the types of privacy enhancing technologies that are out there. This is what they look like, and this is how they can be deployed within an organization or a government. That type of stepped approach, I think, would be really, really useful, particularly in jurisdictions like this one. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all of you um, for being here in person, online, uh, to incredible hours. Um, I took note of, of the, the different suggestions. Um, and what is also great is that I think with this event we have been able also to extend the understanding of, of, of what pets or what the role of digital technologies could be beyond just those um, almost today traditional uh, technologies uh, to something that is br much, much broader. And with that, thank you very much. And um, we look forward to definitely continue the conversation. Thank you. Bye.